Hello and welcome to Supplement, a podcast of the Economic and Political Weekly. On this season of Supplement, we bring you experiences from the field published in EPW Postscript, read by the authors. On today's episode, we have Surya Sen reading his piece about his friendship with the down-on-his-luck adulterer and cattle smuggler who also happened to be his primary contact in the field. Surya Sen teaches at the Department of Political Science, St. Joseph's University, Bangalore. And now, Surya Sen. The Myth of Roshidun For my doctoral research, I spent a year studying local communities in the North Bengal borderland. During this time, I became friends with Roshidun, who eventually became my primary contact and a gateway to my experiences there. As we peeled back the layers of our pasts, it revealed traces of a friendship that would come to be tested during my stay in his village. It took less than a week for us to open our lives to each other, although mine paled in comparison to his experiences. Before becoming a cattle smuggler, Roshidun tried his best to stay on the straight and narrow path of limited opportunities available in that area. From what I could tell, the underlying risks of an illegal occupation contributed to its temptation for him. Over a short yet profitable stint in smuggling bovines, Roshidun claimed control of his life and destiny. He said he felt like a hero from a movie when he ventured out in his rickety van under the dense cover of the winter fog. Emboldened, he had begun an extramarital affair with a woman whose father rented out their home as a halfway house for smugglers. Roshidun's refusal to promise marriage to her prompted the father to file a complaint against him in the local thana. Since they could not press charges of illegal smuggling, fearing self-incrimination, Roshidun only served time for his lesser misdemeanors. Following his arrest, residents of the village grew cautious of interacting with Roshidun, labeling him bad company. It was clear that Roshidun's present was a far cry from his life as a smuggler. The lack of viable opportunities in the village for the adulterer cattle smuggler left his days wide open. This was a serendipitous alignment of circumstances as it eventually brought us together. When we met the first time, Roshidun inquired about the purpose of my stay. He volunteered to help in finding people to interview and access poorest sectors of the border, the vestigial remnants of his past occupation. But his help came with cautionary advice that felt close to the experiences of his ostracization from the local community. People here are nice. They are simple. Do not take advantage of them and they will take care of you. As our association gained more visibility, I would frequently be addressed as Shaheb or Master and him as Mokkil or Client whenever we would pass through the market on our way to an interview site. It proved difficult to ignore how appellations of an alluded financial agreement were affecting Roshidun. During one of our regular winter afternoon walks across the dried up Tista riverbed, he explained how these insinuations stabbed at his unrelenting financial anguish and his isolation from the village, still quite raw and fresh in his memory. The allusions to an employer-employee dynamic aggravated the loss of control that was consuming his life. Roshidun's next great plan was to fish the local stream. The weight of the expected catch would net a profit that would be sufficient to see out the year. The dearth of initial capital to rent motorized pumps required for the effort prompted him to search for local investors. Within days, Roshidun had assembled a crew of six villagers, also down on luck and money. The burden of success grew heavier now. The crew started draining a catchment of the stream at night so that by dawn they could move in with their nets. Without any interview scheduled the following morning, I headed over to the stream hoping to see Roshidun and his crew drawing in their catch. As I neared the culvert to secure a good view, I saw a crowd had already gathered there. Word of Roshidun's plans had spread wide and fast to neighboring villages as well. 
I gathered from the hubbub that this was not the first time Roshidun tried to fish this stream, a detail he kept from me. A year ago, his efforts were thwarted by the incoming Kalboishaki storm, which replenished the volume he had managed to drain out. The stream was an outlet for runoff from Tista River, usually re-diverted to local rice and tobacco fields. Whenever there was an overflow in the municipality catchment, instead of diverting it to the fields and flooding them, the excess volume was channeled through the stream back to the river. These releases were not planned, and without warning, Roshidun's crew was caught unaware when a percolating rill, distinctively muddier than what they were fishing in, eventually turned into an incoming torrent. I watched from the culvert as the team scampered to pick off fish that was caught in the mud, trying to beat the tide that would eventually submerge the exposed stream. The crowd began to laugh at the sudden turn of events, even those initially convinced of Roshidun's success joining in. Eventually, the chides and rebukes from the crowd found their way towards me. My identity as someone from the city and a doctor or doctor was leveraged in comments, ridiculing my inability to see the eventuality of failure in Roshidun's plan. I was more concerned about Roshidun as the barrage of contempt from onlookers grew suggestively in response to his desperation to forestall failure. By scooping up hapless snakeheads and climbing perch, wriggling their bodies to make it back into the water. Gathering their infinitesimal hull, a far cry from what they had dreamt of through the hours they put into draining the pool, Roshidun's crew made a hasty exit from the eye of this gathering tempest of derision more unforgiving than last year's Kalboishaki. Roshidun's inability to accept his failures would destroy the final vestiges of his relationship with the village and our association as well. The next day as I ventured out, Roshidun was nowhere to be seen. I tried calling, but as usual, his mobile phone was unreachable, suspended because of the non-payment of dues. Inquiring about this, I found out from a local acquaintance that Roshidun returned to the pool late in the night with a bottle of pesticide and released its contents into the stream. He skimmed off whatever fish was shocked by the chemicals in a last-ditch attempt to break even on his investment. He took me to the culvert from where the veracity of his account became evident, sans Roshidun's alleged involvement. The surface of the pool was littered with stiff dead fish. The extent of the damage he claimed to have witnessed at the first light of day was no longer apparent, as he stated that the bigger fish had been scavenged off by villagers despite the obvious perils of consuming poisoned flesh. The criminal nature of his offence in poisoning a local water source gathered momentum as Roshidun's character was once more textured with shades of his past notoriety. I heard the police were searching for him, and his conspicuous absence fueled local speculations of his motives and whereabouts. Roshidun's advice to not mistake the local simplicity as naivety was enough for me to prematurely conclude our association, a separation I had anticipated coming forth upon my departure from the village. The paucity of time created by the distractions of Roshidun's misadventures necessitated a deep dive into my work over the final weeks of my stay. I thought his exile would be temporary, concluding once things settled back to normal. But I never saw Roshidun again. I found out after my departure from a resident I remained in contact with that Roshidun was now a truck driver. He transported boulders from the Tista's banks to factories where it would be broken down to chippings and shingle for construction projects in the North Bengal and Sikkimese hills. It seemed as though this trade, carrying boulders washed down by the river back to the mountains, could only choose Roshidun as the agent of redeposition, a Sisyphean end for someone whose attempts to take charge of his life brought him back to the point where he first started. That's it for today. You can find photos from the field as well as a link to this article in the show notes on our website epw.in/podcasts 
where you can also find more episodes of Supplement and our other podcast, Research Radio. To experience all that EPW has to offer, head over to epw.in and subscribe today. This is Johan saying, bye-bye for now.